Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marenzi First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marenzi AG or Marenzi First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. He looks so scared. He's like, my wife's going to come up here. She wants to share with you. Oh, my goodness, what's she going to say? Um, <laughs> it's probably because I just asked him a second ago if I could come up here. Um, I like to do that to him all the time. No, um, this week I, I just struggled. I tried to make a video to kind of explain what God did when I was in the hospital and what he's done over the last seven months. And um, I was like, and I brought my phone up just so you know, so I can keep track of my time or I'll like, I'll preach the whole thing. So, uh, so I did, it's 1144. So I, I did bring it up so I can keep track of myself. But um, so like in the beginning of the video, I was like, I'm going to make this really short and just tell you the facts. And then 15 minutes later, I was like, okay, so I'm going to make a part two and um, post that. So then I made a part no, two. I don't believe that at all. <laughs> So I didn't post part one. Thank goodness I didn't post part one because I was like, well, I'll just wait to see how it turns out. So I made a part two. So part two, I was at like 12 minutes and I was like, I'm not even like halfway done. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I just like chucked that aside. And then I was like, well, I'm really better at just like writing, you know, what I, what I feel. So I'll just write it. And then I just, I kind of struggled with that. And then I thought I had it yesterday. And then it was just like, no, this isn't what God wants. God wants me to just share it, you know, um, just talking. And so um, this morning, I kind of felt like he wanted me to share it with you guys. And we didn't get a chance to talk because Sunday mornings in our house are crazy. And then, so then during worship, um, I was like, okay, so God, if he asks me to come up here and do it, then I'll do it. Um, but if he doesn't ask me, then I'm going to take that as like, you don't want me to do it this morning. And then... Sometimes that's fine, you know, you lay a fleece out kind of, but then sometimes God's like, I'm sorry, but I'm God, you're not, you don't make the rules, um, I'm telling you to do something, so just ask him if you can do it. So that's what I did. So um, basically, I'm going to be really honest with you, and I'm just going to trust that you love us, and that you know that we're human, um, and that we're not perfect, you've probably figured that out by now. But um, hopefully, my hope is that you can learn from my experience. And I'm going to ugly cry. I already know it. So um, I shouldn't have worn mascara. But um, basically, I told, I told Pastor the other day, I said, I feel like, you know, I was just talking to him. And he said, you know, I would have, and baby, you got to give me a little grace here, okay? I'll make it up to you, I promise. But he said, I feel like, you know, or he said, I would have shared a little bit more last Sunday. He said, but you and I agreed that, you know, we wouldn't really share certain things in front of our children because we didn't tell them every detail. And just give me a little bit of grace, okay? And I said, I know. And I said, but you know, I just kind of feel like the whole thing needs to be told. And, um, and I said, but I said, I'm glad you didn't say it because I don't really feel like you were supposed to. I said, I feel like I was, I'm supposed to, I said, because I feel like maybe I'm just, I don't know, like I'm more affected by it. Um, because, and y'all, this is probably sounding really dramatic, but just follow me for a second. I'm not trying to be but I said, I think maybe it's affecting me more because I'm the one that has to face the facts and deal with the fact that I didn't trust God the way I should have. And I'm the one that has to come to terms with that. I've been saved for many years. You know, since I was a kid, I was eight years old. My teenage years got kind of rocky. Um, but I came back to God and devoted my life to him years ago you know, before he and I were married, you know, you know, I've been on a, on a, you know, path with God, you know, running after God since I was 19 years old. And honestly, there, there really isn't an excuse 
for the lack of faith that I had over this past seven months. I want your forgiveness because I'm your pastor's wife and I should have done better. Now, I'm not saying that I never had any faith or that I didn't have faith every single moment. I'm sorry. He's like, oh my gosh, really? Uh, But I did not have the faith that I should have had. And this is what I want you to learn from me is the enemy dangled a lie in front of me and he dangled a lie of death in front of me. And I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Instead of believing God's word over my life, I bought into fear and worry. And I've always been a worrier. And, you know, we lost our son. And I think that just is something that, you know, you grapple with for the rest of your life. That you know that sometimes, you know, God doesn't heal, you know, for for his purposes that I'll find out one day. And one day I will find out it is worth it. You know, but right now I'm a mama and I want my son here with me. And so it's hard to believe that it's worth it, you know. But but I do know, I do know that it, that Ethan's death was for many purposes. I mean, we've seen some of them. We've seen some people come to Christ. We've seen some people say that it's changed the way that they're, they're parents, you know, forever. But so seven months ago, you all know, you know, I started, I just one day started having trouble breathing. But let me just back up a little bit, just real quick and give the timeline. So, you know, I was born, obviously. <laughs> And then I was born with our familial heart problem, which is a rare heart defect that runs in our family. My dad has it. It comes down through his line. Uh, 50% chance that all of my children will have it. We found out that when I was already pregnant with Ethan, but it wouldn't have mattered. We would have had him anyway. Um, We had Emily. She had the heart problem. She had her surgeries, never had any symptoms of the disease. You know, it never even affected her life. She had her surgery so early. She had her last one at 11 months old. Um, She was supposed to have more, but God, you know, just let her heart grow enough that it just grew with her, and she's done beautifully. Ethan was supposed to be the same way, and then he went into cardiac arrest from anesthesia. So, um, you know, so he dies at three months old. I get pregnant with Julia. She's diagnosed with a heart problem in my womb. Now they're really, really proactive about finding out when I'm pregnant. She was the first child we knew before she was born. And then they're all ready. You know, she has to be born at UAB in Birmingham. They're going to whisk her right to surgery. Then before she's born, God starts working. So they're like, okay, we're not going to whisk her right to surgery. But she's being taken straight to the cardiac NICU um, when she's born, which is what they did. And then the next day they found out, oh, wait a minute, she doesn't have a heart problem. And it was awesome. So we always say God healed all three of our children, Emily, through the hands of a very, very skilled surgeon and cardiologist. Uh, two of them actually, Uh, Ethan by taking him home, not what we wanted, but he still healed Ethan, and Julia by a supernatural miracle, right? God's three ways to heal. So meanwhile, I'm rocking along with the heart problem. I've never even had a cardiac cath. It's so mild in me. You know, my children were severe. Mine was mild, is mild. So then five years ago, um, teaching vacation Bible school. You guys have heard this story. I get a virus, and it sets off an autoimmune disease in my body um, instead of recovering. Like normally, you know, a kid passes you a cold or your spouse or whatever, and you, you're better a couple days later. I never got better. So that's what we've been dealing with for the last five years, only they can't figure out which autoimmune disease it is. Um, so then three years ago, I had a stroke, And then we found out that I had actually had multiple strokes that we didn't know about. So that's when we found out I had a hole in my heart between the left and right chamber. It's actually very common. One of four of you in this room, not to scare you, but you have that hole. Um, And it usually does not affect your life at all. But just a small percentage of people, it allows a blood clot through and it can cause strokes. So they close that hole. I have a closure device. So here we are rocking along with autoimmune disease, which causes me pain and, and other issues. And then this June hits. So we all fall on that whole dramatic saga. Okay. So then I can't breathe. And I think, oh, my goodness, it's my heart problem. 
you know, because that's the only thing I can think. It's kind of like heart symptoms. So, um, you know, some, most of you know, like pretty much, you know, we went to ERs, you know, we try to get diagnosed. And um, my primary care doctor, excellent doctor, he did everything he could. And then he referred me out to a pulmonologist in Tucson who is excellent. The pulmonologist put the pieces together and he said, I believe you have pulmonary hypertension. Well, we didn't know what pulmonary hypertension was, so we're just running our mouths in the car. We're like, okay, pulmonary hypertension. And he's like, I think the only person, the only people that are qualified to see you with all of your extenuating circumstances, which is why I, part of the reason why I went through that, um, he said is in Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So I'm gonna drink my husband's water because we're married. <laughs> so too bad for you. There's more bottles down there. So, um, so we were trying to get insurance to cover that. They didn't. So he told us his second choice, University of California. So we were in the process of that, and then like January 13th or whatever, a couple weekends ago hit, and that got even worse. So we worried about a pulmonary embolism, which is what we had worried about at first seven months ago. So um, we got checked out here locally at our urgent care, which is excellent. Um, they were able to clear me of that, and I had my third negative COVID test. Um, and then my cardiologist ended up sending me to the Tucson, in, I mean, to the ER banner in Tucson. Um, so that brings us kind of to what God did. This, that whole seven months, um, when I found out what pulmonary hypertension was, this is the part you got to give me grace, honey is pulmonary hypertension is a very serious disease. The kids ended up hearing me on the phone talk to the doctor, so they heard that it was a serious disease. But we just let them know that, you know, if mama had it, then mama would sometimes have to use oxygen at home probably. Um, but what we didn't really get into because we felt like it wasn't necessary until we had a diagnosis is that pulmonary hypertension severely limits your lifespan. Even with the most meticulous, uh, aggressive and perfect treatment, it severely limits your lifespan. And if anybody's watching or in here that has pulmonary hypertension, I'm not trying to scare you or whatever, but you know, up until the 90s, there was no treatment. People just passed away after a couple of, after like two years. Um, but now it usually takes two to five years for someone to get diagnosed, which is a major problem. Um, but then their, their lifespan is severely, severely limited. Emily's 16 and Julia is nine. So I'm not ready to go anywhere. So this is where I bought into the enemy's lie. And I hope I didn't take, my Lord, my husband's gonna kill me. Okay, it's been 11 minutes. Okay, this is, <laughs> this is, where, this is where I bought into the enemy's lies. Instead of, and I'm not talking about name it, claim it. I'm talking about real faith. Instead of me reading the word and that song, for some reason, I don't know why I didn't hear it until last Sunday or why it didn't compute when I heard it, you know. But when I heard it last Sunday from home, I just, I played it and played it and played it and played it all week long. I played it all this morning, you know, a better word, you know, by Leland, but y'all do it better. <laughs> but you know, when it says a better word, the words of that song, you know, it's like that is, is God's song for me, you know. And if you haven't heard it, you need to go home and listen to it. But that's God's word over your life. It talks about how he takes your past and rewrites. He rewrites your history. You know, I have a medical history of a, mun of, of a bunch of junk. So what? I'm a new creation in Christ, and so are you. You might have a medical history of a bunch of junk. So what? You're a new creation in Christ, and he rewrites your history. You know, he talks about, how, you know, he has better things for you. He has a better future for you. He's the one that knows your destiny, and that song talks about that, about your destiny, the destiny that he has for you. And instead of me focusing on that, I focus on the fact that I might have to leave my children and my husband, and shame on me. And I know that God doesn't, is not a God of condemnation. And then I know I'm saved in Christ Jesus. And I promise you, I'm not being too hard on myself. 
I am looking at myself, though, honestly. And I'm saying, I should know better. I know better. He healed a baby that was inside my womb. I should know better. He's gotten me through 10 years. After I put my son in the ground, I breathe every day because of him. I sm I'm able to smile and laugh with my children. I'm able to experience joy after that kind of heartache. I should know better. You know, I've, I've made the statement, and, and I think it's an okay statement to make, but I've made the statement that I know the Holy Spirit has gotten me through the last 10 years because if he hadn't, if he hadn't given me every breath, I would be in a white padded room after the death of my son. I know better. I know the power of Jesus Christ to heal physically and mentally and spiritually and emotionally. Shame on me for not calling down that power because a doctor in innocent, you know, trying to help said, hey, I think this is, this is what you have and let's get you to a doctor so we can confirm. Now, I will say that all of my symptoms line up with pulmonary hypertension. They do. And what I actually have, you can't find it when you Google. So in all fairness, it made sense. It does make sense. It still makes sense. But instead of me focusing on God's truth and what he had to say to me, and maybe if I would have been a little more focused on God's truth, God might have revealed the truth to me and said, my daughter, you don't have that. But I was so focused on buying into the lie of the enemy. Does that make sense? that I let him tell me what I have. And shame on me for that. So I'm in the hospital, you know, and the cardiology team says, we're gonna keep you, you know, um, we're gonna run a bunch of tests and get to the bottom of this, you know, yeah, this is weird, you know, you, you can't go home. And I was relieved, to be honest, because I'd been there over the past month, I've been to ERs and they kept sending me home, you know, so, they kept me and um, God just blessed me in every way. He put me on the floor, on the cancer floor. And y'all, I gotta tell you this really quick. I, I'm being really quick. Um, he put me on the cancer floor and they were rolling me to the cancer floor. And I'm like, they didn't tell me what, what, what the, that they were putting me on that floor. So they're rolling me to the cancer floor and the transport nurse is like, um, have you ever been on this floor before? And I'm like, no. So we get to the room and there's like two people, you know, two nurses waiting for me. And I'm like, um, should I be concerned that I'm on the, on this floor? And they're like, kind of offended. They're like, uh, we'll take really good care of you. And I'm like, no, like, should I be concerned that I'm on the cancer floor? And they're like, um, no, we will take good care. Of I'm like, like, should I be concerned that I'm on the cancer floor? Like, and they're like, oh, there just wasn't room in the cardiac, you know, in the CIC. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, um, I just <laughs> thought maybe y'all knew something I didn't know because they had already done blood work and x-rays and different things. I'm like, y'all maybe want to tell somebody before you just wheel them to the cancer floor. So, but what was, what was awesome about being on the cancer floor is because people on the cancer floor are going through chemotherapy and everything, they don't have immune systems that are working. Um, so the rooms are like positive, negative um, pressure. They're pressurized. So the rooms are actually pressurized so that when the nurses and everybody come into the room, it keeps the, the germs that they have out. So with COVID going on, I felt like God gave me an extra layer of protection, even in the room he placed me in. It, it, I just felt like God was just working all around. So I saw cardiologists and then I saw a pulmonologist and here's where it gets really exciting. So the pulmonologist that I saw, he talked to me for a long time, and I could go on forever, but I won't. And then he said, he said, you are really lucky this week. He said, 
we actually have a world-renowned pulmonologist who is here this week. He said his name is Franz Richard, and he said he is one of the leading doctors in his field. He's one of the leading pulmonary hypertension specialists. And he said he actually, he's, ma he's into research, like majorly into research, and he said he actually writes a lot of the guides that the doctors at Mayo Clinic and other pulmonary hypertension clinics follow. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And so he told me at length about Dr. Richard and everything, and he said, here's the thing. And Dr. Richard's a professor, you know, he teaches doctors and everything as well. And he said, here's the thing. He said, I would never tell you not to get a second opinion. He said, don't ever let a doctor tell you that. He said, that is your right, and a doctor should never be offended that you want to get a second opinion. He said, but just personally, if it was my mother, I would trust Dr. Richard with my mother with no second opinion. If Dr. Richard told me I didn't have pulmonary hypertension, it would be case closed for me. That's how much I trust him. And I'm like, wow, that's awesome. So I met Dr. Richard, and you know, I had an echo, like I had an echo with a bubble study to make sure my PFO was still closed, and all all these different tests. But then I had the gold standard test for pulmonary hypertension, which is um, a right heart, right heart cath with an exercise study. So you can have a right heart cath for pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension, but he even added the exercise study. So, and he, he's like, there is absolutely no way you have pulmonary hypertension, no way. So it's awesome. And I give God glory for that, complete glory for that. Um, and I, I'm telling you, I feel like it's a miracle because I just can't, I mean, I can't even, I'm probably not explaining at all uh, very well what he did, but I felt like he orchestrated um, me to be there at the right time, you know, the right place at the right time. He brought this doctor so we don't have to go to Mayo Clinic in, in wherever, Minnesota. We don't have to go to University of California. Our hearts were settled. Dr. Richard is the most awesome doctor. He is so humble, so kind, so talented, such a genius. And I believe these qualities were given to him by God directly. And I will tell you, he, I, wa I was awake during the right heart cath. I watched him teach his students. I watched him do the portions of the cath on me and watched him guide them do the portions and everything. And um, of course, my body had to be weird. So the right heart cath took two hours or over two hours um, because he couldn't get access, because he couldn't get into my veins and everything. And I saw him stand back, and I saw him work when there was a problem, and I saw him think it through, and I saw him, you know, so I saw him even in a high-pressure, you know, high-stress high, uh, situation. And, um, and I, just, I just fully believe that this was directly from God. Um, so, and then the awesome, the awesome thing is, so, okay, so they did find the problem that Pastor shared with you where... Um, and I forget the exact name. It's like oxygen depletion syndrome, something like that. But, but that's not exactly it. But anyway, uh, um, I was just so happy I didn't have pulmonary hypertension, to be honest. I should have, like, paid more attention to that name. But, um, but it, is a rare, it is a rare thing that is possibly genetic, um, maybe from my heart problem. But really, it usually is from an autoimmune disease. You usually get it from an autoimmune disease. Um, and if it's from my heart problem, it should have shown up when I was young when I was a child. Um, so um, we don't know the exact cause yet, and th he said there are other things going on because it still doesn't explain, like, why it came on suddenly in June and other things. But um, it just simply means that when my heart and lungs, which are strong and in excellent shape, he said, but when my heart and lungs uh, produce oxygen, my muscles are not accepting that oxygen, and instead they're producing lactic acid, so then it's making my heart and lungs work harder, and it's just a vicious cycle. So um, he does have a treatment plan. He's working on a treatment plan. I'm going to be, I started cardiac rehabilitation, which is, he's hoping will help with that. Um, and we're just, you know, eventually, if, it, if we can't deal with it, I might have to go to Boston or Massachusetts. There's no known treatment for this disease at all. 
Um, so there's some clinical trials and things like that, but we're hoping to not have to go that far. So I would love it if you guys would pray for me that God would complete the healing. And this time, I promise you, I am going to have faith because I've seen not what he did this time, but what he's done before. And my hiney has been spanked <laughs> by my God because you know what? He loves me enough to discipline me. Just like I love my children enough to discipline them, he loves me enough to discipline me. So he loves me enough that he convicted me when I was wrong. And, it, and honestly, it was a sin. It was a sin not to trust him and believe him. And I know this might sound funny, but I have joy in my spirit that my father loves me enough that he wants me to live a whole life that is so close to him and so wrapped up in him that when I don't have the faith that I should have and I don't have the trust that I should have, he spanks my hiney. You know what I mean? I want that relationship with him. And that's one thing that I would never, obviously, wish the death of a child on anyone or any other heartbreaking loss like that. Because that's not the only one loss that's heartbreaking like that. But I will tell you this, that some of the closest times I've ever had with my father God were the lowest times after the loss of my son. Because when you realize that there is nobody He's the only one that understands, you know, really what losing Ethan is like from a parent, you know, point of view. But when you realize that even that one person that, you know, understands the most, even still, I'm the only one that was Ethan's mama, you know? And so when you come to the point in your life when you realize that no human can fully understand, no human can fill that void, you cling to Jesus like never before, never before. So I, I, so despite the tears and the ugly crying and all of that, I have this joy in my heart that my father loves me that much. So I pray that you learn from my mistake and that when you're facing something, or you're facing something today or you're facing something in the future, that you remember that, you know what, you need to have extraordinary faith, which is the words God gave me for this year, extraordinary faith. So I'm picking myself back up and I'm saying, okay, I've got 11 months of this year left. Extraordinary faith is what it's going to be. So I hope you'll join me. It's a long time. I'm just, it's 25 minutes. You know, when you, when you think about believe, you know, I really, I think believe is the right word. And, and um, you think about believing of God and, and believing in God. You know, you go back to the Garden of Eden. We always think about Adam and Eve. And we think about how, you know, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat this fruit or you will die. We kind of think of it as this huge commandment and that God was saying, you know, hey, this stern do's and don'ts, you know, eat this fruit, you will die. I honestly don't think of it that way. I honestly think that, that instead of being a, a rule so much, it was more of a warning. And I think God was saying, if you do this, this is what will happen. And I think if you follow that line of thinking all the way through Scripture, God is telling us over and over and over again that he wants us to believe him and to trust in him, to take him at face value and, and to really just... And if you think about it, you know, we tell our kids all the time, we say, you know, don't touch this fire, it's hot. And, and the truth of the matter is, is we want them to believe us enough not to touch the fire because we don't want them to get hurt. And, you know, we, we all of the time say, and, and I hear people say, and I've said many times, you know, we say that experience is the greatest teacher, but the Bible disagrees with that. You know, the Bible actually says that faith and obedience is the greatest teacher. And the reason for that is, is because God wants you to believe him so that you don't have the experience of pain. 
So the, the whole point of that is, is that God is saying, okay, wait a minute. If you believe me, if you trust me, then you don't have to go through that. And see, that's my greatest desire as a father, that my children will trust me, that they will believe me so much that God is who he said he is, and that sin is so bad that they don't have to have a million years or a million bad experiences to realize it's true. And my my ultimate desire for you as your pastor is that we will form such that you will see my life that you will know my love for you and and you will see that that i'm trying to be as open as i can be that when i tell you that god is good and and sin is destructive that you won't have to hit rock bottom to believe me and that's the whole goal of the way that we try to live our lives is so that you know belief is the is the right word and, and that's the point of what God is, is saying. Hey, wait a minute, but believe, believe me. You know, and, and today we were going to talk about, you know, sin and, and, and how God tells us, you know, hey, believe me that sin, he's told, you know, Cain, hey, wait a minute, sin is crouching at your door. It's it's earnestly it's earnestly desiring to control you, to to desiring to manipulate you, to run your life, and it's it's so crouching at your door. But you have an option: you can believe me and take my warning, or you can let it have its way. And and. The, the awesome verse right before then, if you jump back to verse number six, and I know we didn't read anything, but that's okay. Believe me, it's there. <laughs> Thomas, you can put it up. <laughs> We're running out of time. Let's... Verse number six, God says something very, very amazing to Cain. He says, he says, if you would have done what was right, wouldn't you have been accepted? If you would have done what was right, wouldn't you have been accepted? But because you're not doing what is right, don't you know that sin is crouching at your door wanting to control you? So, so what does it let us know that... that how do we overcome that desire for sin? How do we overcome the enemy? Obedience. Genuine obedience shuts the door to desire to sin. Ooh, that's good. I just came up there on the fly. I like that. Genuine obedience overcomes the desire of sin. Do you believe me? Then you jump over to King Manasseh, and, and I love this story. And this one's been running over and over and over in my head, and it fits together. And this was a bad dude. You know, he rebuilds the, the temples of Baal, and, and he brings back sacrifices and and. He does everything you can do to hurt God and to lead his people in idol worship. But then he does something that just really brings God ang God's anger. He sacrifices his baby to Baal. And God doesn't like that. So God sends a warning, a message to him. And he says, hey, if you don't get things right, judgment is coming. Well, he didn't listen. He didn't pay attention. So all of a sudden, this invading army comes, and, and the Bible actually tells us that they, they catch him with hooks. It's an amazing story. They catch him with hooks. So they drag him off, and he hits rock bottom. You see, here's the thing about God is, is if we don't humble ourselves, we will be humbled. The Bible tells us that every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I know there's some tough guys out there that says that God hasn't done anything for me and I won't bow. No, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The difference is, is if you bow now, it will change your destiny. If you bow then, it won't change anything. But you will bow and you will confess. Anyway, King Manasseh, they, they take him with hooks and he hits rock bottom. And, and the Bible tells us that when he hits rock bottom, he actually humbles himself and he begins to confess and he begins to say, God, you know, I'm sorry. And, and he begins to change everything and he begins to say, why, why didn't I believe what you said? 
Why didn't I take you at face value? Because now basically there are hooks in my nose. Who's writing your destiny? You know, there, there are so many of us today that, you know, God is speaking and, and God has given us his word and, and God is leading us and directing us and asking us this question. Do you trust me? Do you believe what I said? Do you believe who I am? We confess it with our mouth, but do we believe it in our heart? And there's a huge difference with that because so many of us really don't believe it in our heart. Because if you believe it in your heart, it changes your actions. It changes who you are. Your actions become different. Amen. It becomes a part of your lifestyle. And that's the whole point of living for Christ. It's not exactly a, a, a two-second prayer, but it's a lifestyle that you live out. So what I want to ask you today, and, and we're going to get ready to close in just a minute. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. And if, if they can do the new song from last week, I think that's a good way to close today. And then I want us to spend some special time with prayer today. Because I want us to ask this story, and I want you to ask this story, and I want you to be genuine with this. Who's writing your history, and who do you believe today? Are you believing your finances? Are you believing your health? Are you believing your boss? Are you believing COVID? Are you believing your work situation? Are you believing what the doctors told you? Are you believing? Are you believing what your family situation is? Are you believing your own lies? You know, I've come to find out I'm my own worst enemy. My own heart is lying to myself all the time. but we're constantly in war. And I want you to think of something. When you think of sin, do you see a warrior that is ready to pounce on you or do you see something that just happens? I think our greatest problem is our naivety of who our enemy really is. And our, we're so oblivious to how evil and how intentful the devil really is to take us out. He is constantly on the prowl. He's constantly looking for an open door. And yet we play with him. We dabble with him. We let him have inches. We don't stay prayed up. We don't stay in the word. We don't stay in communion with God's people. We, we really shut him out so much. And we wonder why the enemy gets footholds. We're so naive when it comes to the enemy and spiritual warfare. And the enemy in so many aspects controls so much of our lives. It controls our emotions, it controls how we think, and it controls our very thoughts and actions. But there has to come a point when we're like King Manasseh and we say, okay, Lord, I should have heard your voice. And there has to come a point where we say, okay, I don't want to live under the devil's rule anymore. I don't want to have to live under my fear anymore. I don't want to have to live under oppression or depression. or I don't want to live under anything else. Nothing has the right to rule me but Jesus. And I'm sick of it. And it's time that we begin to throw off those shackles and throw off all of those things because we're in a world that's right now stuck with fear and stuck with oppression and stuck with worry and stuck with everything going on. We have family issues and financial issues and what's going to happen tomorrow? And if you let it steal your joy, it will. If you let it steal who you are, you know, it will steal your own personality. You won't even respond the same. I've seen people that used to be so bubbly, even in the store, they're not the same person. Why? It's not that they're not good people. It's that they're carrying so much extra weight. But you know what? My Bible tells me that we can cast all of our cares upon him and that he will carry the load. So are you ready to let him carry your load? Who are you believing? Who are you anchored to? Who's writing your history? 
time is really early, so no one has to buck out here for lunch. I haven't eaten in seven days, so if I can handle it, you can too. Hang in there. We're going to pray for a minute. The band's going to lead us in, one of the, in an awesome song. And I want us to worship in our spirit, and I want us to pray in our heart. And I want you to declare today, we're putting Jesus first. We're tearing down the idols. We're believing his word over our lives. Sickness has to go. Fear has to go. Disease has to go. Depression has to go. We're taking our lives back. Are you ready? All right, let's do that. All right, Patty, you can start singing. All right, the rest of us, let's stand. Find ourselves a place to pray. The altars are open. You can play where you are. But don't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. God is in the house. It's time to make a difference. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? I take no pleasure, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. So come under the shadow of my wing, my children. Come under the shadow of my wing. Don't hold back your hearts anymore. Come unto me, for I love you with an everlasting love. Jesus.